Okay, the whole point of making a scatter plot like we did in the last video is to create some kind of model that we can use to predict future values. We're going to use one of the examples from the last video. We're looking at the diamond example. So remember on the x-axis we had number of carats um, for a particular diamond, and on the y-axis we had the price of the diamond. Typically a diamond that has a larger carat value is more expensive. Okay, so most of this you're going to be able to do on your own because it's a little bit of algebra. Okay, uh, let's start by taking a look at this equation because there's a couple things about it that are a little strange. First of all, you'll notice this, this little carrot. Carrot, I didn't, I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, we're not going to call it a carrot, we're going to call it a hat. So the way you should say this is y hat or price hat. It's the y variable. The hat indicates that it is a predicted value. It's not the actual y value, it's what we predict using our line. You'll notice that this is almost in y equals mx plus b form, which is probably the form that you are most familiar with from algebra, slope-intercept form, except for whatever reason in statistics, we usually do it backwards and we say b plus mx. Um, and also, just to make things even more confusing, we usually don't use m and b. Usually the y-intercept is called a and the slope is called b. Yeah, they're not making it easy for you. <laughs> so in general, our equation of a line is y hat equals a plus b x, which essentially is the same thing as slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b. It's just we use slightly different letters and we usually write it in a slightly different order. So anyway, all that to say, this is the equation um, for this scatter plot, and I have it partially shown because I have answers written here. Um, you plug in a value for carat, and it'll give you a predicted value for the price of that diamond. So what I'd like you to do next is pause the video and try the rest of the page. Yes, the entire rest of the page. I think you'll be able to do it, um, and then we'll kind of recap once you hit play. All right, so I'm going to be doing the thing where I, in a different color, kind of jot down some notes. So the first thing you had to do was interpret the slope. So our slope is 8,119.22. So, you might remember from an algebra class that slope is change in y over change in x, or you might have learned rise over run. Um, so when you're interpreting the slope, you can think about this change in y over change in x to help you write your interpretation. What I said was, when the caret value increases by 1, the price of the diamond goes up or increases by $8,119.22. In general, what you can always say is, as x increases by 1, y increases, or decreases, by blank. Now, it is really important that you include context. In pretty much any AP problem for this class, you want to include context in any answer. It's usually partial credit. So resist the temptation to just say, when x goes up by 1, y goes up by 8,000. You want to say, when carrots increase by 1, that's all it takes to get context in the question. Okay, now y-intercept is kind of silly. Um, a diamond with zero carats is worth negative $1,608. Yeah, you'll actually be paid to take a zero carat diamond, I guess. Um, the y-intercept doesn't always make sense. It still is the y-intercept, it just doesn't make practical sense. And very often that is the case. It's just an unfortunate reality for our y-intercept. Predicting the price for a 0.6 carat diamond, you're just plugging in 0.6. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. D, should we use this model to predict the price of the Hope diamond, which is around 45 carats? Um, probably not. This scatter plot only went up to 1.1 carats, um, and so we can't be sure that this pattern is going to continue all the way to 45 carats. When you use a line to predict, way past your x values range, that's called extrapolation. So usually you should only use the line to predict values within the range that you have. If it goes a little bit past your range, that's usually okay, but you don't want to go too far because we don't know if this pattern continues. Um, there could be um, more like exponential growth if we keep going because it's very possible that by the Hope Diamond it's like so expensive. We don't see a line anymore, we just see like a curve. Um, this is my favorite 
what is this comet called? I always forget. X C X K C D. X K C D. That's it. Uh, this is a perfect example of extrapolation. Yeah, I don't know. It's been printed in, on my bulletin board in my classroom for years. So, long story short, try not to extrapolate. Okay, now for this last one, I wrote the wrong answer first. So, um, a really common mistake is to take r and interpret it as a slope. So, this first one is a very common wrong answer. When the caret value increases by 1, the price increases by $0.945. I don't know what it is about r. I guess it's the fact that if r is positive, the slope is going to be positive. There's something about it that students get it mixed up all the time. So the correct information we can gather from r is that the relationship between the caret and price is quite strong. This is really close to 1. And it's positive, which means when the caret value increases, the price also increases. So it's very easy to get them mixed up. Once again, I can't, I can't explain why it happens. It's just, it's a common mistake. Um, but anyway, review from the last video. R tells you two things, the strength and if it's positive or negative. Okay, hopefully you were able to finish the rest of this page. It's not going to be possible to have a line that hits every single point exactly, unless the relationship is linear exactly, but usually that isn't the case. A good regression line fits so that most of the data points are really close to the line. This sentence in italics is really important, and you can tell it's important because it's in italics. A good regression line makes the vertical distances of the points from the line as small as possible. So if we think about a scatter plot with a line, a regression line is our line that we're using to model the situation. And these vertical distances are basically telling us how good our line is at predicting. If these vertical distances are large, our line isn't very good at predicting. That vertical distance that I drew here in red is called a residual. So what you did in these parts here is you practice calculating one. You first calculated the predicted cost of a 0.8 carat diamond. And that's just by plugging it in. So this is the predicted cost. And then they told us that the actual observed cost was this, $3,808, which is quite a bit different than the predicted value. We're supposed to subtract our answer from part A to find the residual. So we took the observed and subtracted the predicted. This is the residual for that particular diamond. So just written out kind of more formally, a residual is when you take Y minus Y hat. In other words, observed minus predicted. Now in part C, you identified that if you have a residual that's negative, your line is over predicting. So remember when we did z-scores, we talked about how a negative or a positive z-score is really important. The negative or positive tells you information about your data point. Same idea here. A residual can be positive or negative, and the fact that it's positive or negative tells you if the line over or under predicted. The most important thing to remember is that a residual is observed minus predicted, not the other way around. Okay. So for the next part, you're going to go back to the applet from the last video. I will update the notes so that it's actually linked right here. And I want you to follow the directions for 1 through 5. Um, pause the video, do that, and then come back, and we'll do a quick recap. All right, so here we go. I've got about 15 points. Um, the correlation is almost exactly at 0 0.70. Okay, so when I draw my own line, I'd maybe say like that. And now if you click the Show Least Squares line, this is the actual best fit. Now here we have to start talking about what this line is. In middle school or possibly early high school, you might have learned something called the line of best fit. Um, when you made scatter plots, you drew in a line and your teacher said, it's the line of best fit. It fits the data the best. Okay, what we're dealing with now is a line of best fit, but it has a specific name and it is called a least squares regression line, which is why this says show least squares line. So that's the blue one. Clearly, I did not do very well with my, my guess. I can move that there. Perfect. Just like I meant it to be. All right. Show mean x and y lines is next. So what this line is, is the mean of our x variable, and this line is the mean of our y variable. Now, I can move some data points around, and that's going to change the correlation, and it's also changing the line. Okay, so I'm actually going to move this out of the way. 
Okay, and you can see that no matter where I move this point, the mean of x and the mean of y is always a point on the least squares line, which is just kind of a cool thing about the least squares line. x bar, y bar, or the mean of x, mean of y, is always a point on the least squares line. Cool. Uh, number four we're not going to get too into in this video. The next video we'll talk about how good is good, how good is a line at predicting. Um, but for now, just how does an outlier affect the slope and the y-intercept? We can put a data point way off in the x direction and it changes the line quite a bit. We can put it in the, let's see, y direction, maybe doesn't change it quite as much. For now, all you need to know is that an outlier is a point that doesn't fit the general pattern. We'll get more into what an outlier does to the line in the next video. The last thing I want you to look at is the show residuals button. Now this will draw in each residual for you. You can see that for many values, the line under predicted, and for several values, the line over predicted. If you guessed that the sum of the residuals was zero, congratulations. I don't have a prize for you, I'm sorry. The least squares line is designed so that the sum of the residuals is zero. So what you'll see next are just the two facts that you need to know about the least squares regression line for now. First of all, it's called the least squares regression line. Feel free to abbreviate that as LSRL. This course has so many acronyms. The least squares regression line is the line that makes the sum of the squared residuals as small as possible. Now you might be asking yourself, squared residuals? She just told me that the sum of the residuals is zero. I did say that. Thank you for listening. Uh, the sum of the squared residuals we're going to talk about in the next video. Like I said, for now, you just need to know what this definition is, and in the next video, I will show you what that means. These are the two things you have to know about the least squares regression line for now, other than the definition. It always contains this point, x bar, y bar, which is mean of x, mean of y. And the formula for finding the slope of the least squares regression line is as follows. It's actually on the formula sheet. This is copied directly from the formula sheet. Now remember, for whatever reason in statistics, we use b to mean the slope to confuse you, I guess. The slope of the line equals r times the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x. So let's use this in an example. You can see how it works. So this is actually one of the examples from the last video as well. This is the weather example where our x variable is temperature and our y variable is humidity. The correlation coefficient, which is r, not sure why I didn't just write r, to be totally honest. Um, is negative 0.92. That tells us we have a negative direction and there's a fairly strong association. Maybe you can remember that um, scatter plot from the last video. We used it quite a bit. Okay, now what we're supposed to do is calculate the equation for the least squares regression line. Here's the summary statistics. They give us the mean and the standard deviation for our x variable, which was temperature, and the mean and standard deviation for our y variable, which was humidity. So I just wrote here x bar y bar mean for the x, mean for the y, because that is a point on our line. Okay, fun fact about the least squares regression line, it always includes x bar, y bar, so we already have a point, which is pretty great. The only other thing we need to write the equation is the slope. So, as you may remember from one minute ago, uh, this is the equation for slope, r times standard deviation of y over standard deviation of x. So all we're doing is we're plugging in r standard deviation of y, standard deviation of x, and we're calculating the slope. From here on out, this problem is algebra one. Now I happen to be an enormous fan of point slope form, so I am going to use point slope form to write the equation. Feel free to use y equals mx plus b, plug things in, solve for b. I just really like point slope form. A healthy amount, I think. So I'm plugging in um, the point 60.8 and 76.4 and then I'm also plugging in negative 1.105 for the slope and all I need to do is rearrange it so that it looks like it's in slope intercept form. Now one thing that I do in statistics is instead of just writing x and y I like to replace those letters with the actual variable. So I'm calling this humidity instead of y and you'll notice I did the hat because this is predicted humidity. Um, and then instead of x, I called it temp. If you don't do that, if you prefer using x and y, that's fine, but somewhere else you need to write x equals temperature, y equals humidity. 
Um, and once again, that's a College Board thing. They want to see context in every single problem. Um, you'll also notice I did this in the order that I wrote at the beginning. It's not a big deal, but usually in statistics, it's y-intercept and then slope. Okay, why don't you pause the video and try two and three on your own. So for slope, when the temperature increases by one, remember that's our x variable, one degree, sorry, context, the humidity goes down by 1.105%. You didn't see anything. So here's a negative slope. When x is increasing by 1, y is decreasing by blank. The y-intercept, once again, makes no sense. Um, when it's 0 degrees outside, the humidity is 143.584%. Y-intercepts, I tell you. OK, calculate the residual for the 70-degree day when the humidity was 90%. So a residual is the observed value minus the predicted value. So the first thing we have to do is figure out what this predicted value is. Um, they gave us 70 degrees as our x variable, so all we're doing is plugging in 70 to our equation. And then this is the predicted value for a 70 degree day. Now we can just do observed minus predicted. So the actual observed humidity was 90%, so we're going to do 90% minus the predicted value, which was the 66. And here's our residual. Um, your version says interpret mine. Typo, I forgot it. Um, the interpretation of a residual is just the line over or under predicted by this much. So in our case, the line under predicted the humidity by 23.766%. Because it was actually 90%, the line said it was going to be 66. On this particular day, the humidity was actually much higher than the line predicted. So the line under predicted the humidity. In a separate video, I will show you how to do a lot of these things on the calculator, but it is pretty important that you know how to do them by hand, and it is really important that you know how to interpret R, slope, y-intercept, residuals. There's a lot more to statistics than just finding a number and circling it. There's a lot of interpretation. So make sure if there's something you don't understand here that you speak up, ask a question, and find an answer.